the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in that name. Our life will study tonight is Psalm 92. Psalm 92. This psalm actually is titled a psalm, a song called the Sabbath day. This title actually gives no information concerning the time, occasion, so this title gives no information concerning the time, occasion, or even the author's name. It is the only song with this title in the 151 song. And this song, which had its special position in the ministry of the Sabbath, in the temple, reveals the true meaning of the Sabbath for the Jews. Sabbath is the day of worship. It's like our Sabbath now in the New Covenant is Sunday. So the day of worship, sometimes when we think about going to the church, we feel like it's a burden. But you can see in this psalm, it is a day of joy, day of celebration. So it gives us the true meaning of Sabbath for the Jews, which should be the true meaning of Sunday for us, the day of the Lord. It shows that the Sabbath was a day not only for rest, you rest on the seventh day, but for the community of the people to get together and to worship. According to the Levitica, to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 3, it is a holy convocation and intended to be a delight rather than a burden. When we come to church, it's a delightful activity to be with the Lord, not a burden. They say if there is no if the author is not written in the introduction or in the title, then the last author is the author of all the remaining psalms until we find another psalm that has an author. For example, Psalm 90 has the author than Moses, or Moses the prophet. And then for 10 psalms, we don't find any author. That's why according to the Jewish tradition, they say, all these psalms are written by Moses. Because Psalm 90 is written by Moses. Then 91 by Moses, 92 by Moses. As long as the author is not uh, written. So some people believe that the author is Moses. But again, there is no internal evidence or external evidence. Others say it's written by David because he mentioned musical instruments. And he mentioned enemies, and we know David all his life has enemies. And also he mentioned the house and the courts of God. So during Moses, they built the tabernacle of meeting, but also it exists during the time of David. They believe that the mention of the Sabbath refers to the time of rest which David had from his enemies. So when he said a song of the Sabbath, so it means a song for the rest, because Sabbath, as a Hebrew word, means rest. So David actually was singing this song during the time of rest from uh, wars with his enemy. That is for people who said the author is David. But there is another actually strange opinion. Many of the Jewish writers think that this song was written by Adam. Adam, the first man. But if it was, then it should have been placed at the head of the collection of the psalm, even before Psalm 90 that was clearly written by Moses. Besides, during Adam, <laughs> there was no musical instrument. Uh, but this psalm actually in it, like in verse 3, he mentioned musical instrument. So how Adam wrote this? Uh, and they say it was made by him quickly after his creation and his ejection from the paradise. But according to Genesis chapter 4, verse 21, Jubal was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. 
So before Jubal, there was no uh, any musical instrument. Also, during Adam, there was no enemies, no any number of enemies, and which it meant to rise up against him, according to verse 7 of this psalm. So, the, those who said it's written by Adam, there is no evidence, strong evidence to support it. This psalm is not merely an expression of individual gratitude for grace and mercy, because as you're going to read this psalm, there is attitude of gratefulness, thanksgiving. So it's not about personal experience, but speaks on behalf of the whole community of Israel. It is a psalm of worship. When people get together on Sabbath, they use this psalm to worship the Lord. And this psalm teaches us how the believer should react, live, and feel like servants of God, like children of God. It is a song for the Sabbath day. Therefore, it teaches us how we ought to approach the gathered public worship with attitude of joy, attitude of gratefulness, attitude of thanksgiving. The major theme in this psalm is that the people of God should be a people of praise. People of praise. There are those who do not see God for who he is, like the wicked. And their end is destruction. But the people of God, the righteous, will be blessed both now and forevermore. So this another theme in this psalm, uh, the destruction of the wicked and the blessedness of the righteous. This Sabbath psalm is a good reminder of who God is, who we are, and how worthy he is of our praise on the Lord's day and every day. This psalm is just 15 verse from 1 to 3, the duty and advantage of praising God. So, duty, it's our duty to praise the Lord. And there is advantage for us, blessings to us when we praise the Lord. Verse 4 to 6, the greatness of God's work. 7 to 11, the fall of the wicked. As I told you in this psalm, we we'll see the destruction of the wicked and the blessedness of the righteous. And 12 to 15, blessings for the righteous. So let's start from verse 1. So can you imagine people going to the temple to praise the Lord? So what they are saying on the Sabbath? It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. On an instrument of ten strings, on the lute, and on the harp, with harmonious sound. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. So, this Sabbath psalm began with a simple but a profound statement. It is good, good and beneficial for us to give thanks to the Lord. The Lord is the covenant God of Israel, God who entered into a covenant with his people, the creator of heaven and earth. Why it is good to give thanks to God? Because it is the right thing, it is meet and right, it is just, it is befitting, it is uh, proper, and due from us to God our King. Also, when we praise God, it brings joy to our heart. It is delightful. It is pleasant for one that loves to praise the object of his affection. For example, if there is a betrothed couple, you know, it brings delight to the fiancé to uh, praise his betrothed as the object. In the same way, we love God. That's why it brings delight and joy to our heart to praise him, to stand in his presence, and to praise him. You know, the Bible, the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew to Greek. That's what we call it, the Septuagint, right? Because it was translated by Septuagint. But 
there is another translation to the Latin done by Jerome. This translation we call the Vulgate. So the Vulgate is the translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew to Latin, done by Saint Jerome. Saint Jerome, when he translated, he used the word confess instead of give thanks. So it is a good thing to confess to the Lord. And Saint Jerome, who did this translation, he said, when we confess to the Lord, we trust in his mercy. And when we sing the praises, we consummate the good work. And the Catholic Church begins every service with prayer of thanksgiving. Every service, even the funeral. It is greatly important to start our prayer with praises and thanksgiving because it pleases our God and invites our God to come among us and accept the aroma of our praise. It gives us the chance to remember all the great and wonderful things that God has done for us. And also, he does it all day and each day, as we read in Lamentation chapter 3, your mercies are new every morning. Your mercies are new upon us every morning. Also, who actually praise God without ceasing? The angels. So, as we say in St. Gregory liturgy, you give to those who are on earth the praise of the seraphim. So when we praise God, we say in the St. Gregory liturgy, count us with the heavenly ranks. So when we praise God, we are exalted from earthly being to heavenly rank. When we praise God, it's exaltation giving man, human being, earthly being, a share in the office of the heavenly spirit. And giving thanks to God should be continuous, not for a specific occasion, but it must be always under all circumstances. When God does good work for us, or even when God chastises us, or disciplines us, as St. Augustine says, let him always be grateful, never ungrateful. Let him be grateful to his father who soothes and praises him and grateful to his father when he chastens him with the scourge and teach him. For he ever loves, God ever loves, whether he cares or threatens. And let him say what you have heard in the psalm. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing your praises to your name, O Most High. Ask the people who attend the midnight praises. You know, after you attend, you, you'll find your spirit full of joy. When you, you sing to the Lord and praise his holy name, actually it gives us joy and delight in our heart. So the effect of praising God is good, and it is a desirable state of mind. But the unthankful mind is unhappy mind, unhappy mind, a murmuring, complaining, dissatisfied mind, which makes the person pitiful and all around him miserable. Can you imagine if you are befriending somebody always, always complaining, always grumbling, you know? He will make you miserable. Nobody likes to hear complaining all the time. But when you are with somebody who is joyful, thankful, grateful, it will bring joy also to your heart. And he addressed God in verse 1, O Most High. O Most High means, O God who is exalted above all. And the fact is that God is exalted over all is an appropriate thought when we come before him to praise him. Why you are praising him? He is the most high. He is exalted above all. Then he said, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Morning and night. Loving kindness and faithfulness. 
morning and evening are natural time of prayer. That's why if you cannot pray the seven hours of the day, at least it is right, it is proper, it's our duty to praise God in the morning and in the evening. And why you praise Him? He used two things here, loving kindness, which is His mercy, and faithfulness, His honesty. So loving kindness and faithfulness are the attributes which moves God to make and keep his covenant with his people. God made a covenant with us. Don't fear for little blood. It's your father's good pleasure to give the kingdom. Take drink my blood of the new covenant, which uh, will be given for the remission of sin. So it is a covenant. This covenant is based on his loving kindness, not on our worthiness. And also because he is faithful, he will never break his covenant with us. That's why we praise him day and night for his loving kindness and his faithfulness. And there is no better preparation, preparation for a day than a thankful, cheerful mind in the morning. When we wake up in the morning and we praise the Lord. And the suitableness of worship every morning and evening has been almost universally considered in all denominations all over the world. The law of Moses provided uh, by establishment of morning and evening sacrifice with the accompanying ritual. And the morning and evening sacrifice are the basis for the raising of incense in Vespers and Matthews, taken based on the morning and evening sacrifice in the worship in the Old Testament. Also, we have the Ekbeya. The Ekbeya is the seven hours of prayer. But in the Ekbeya, there are two very important prayers, the morning and the night. Proclaiming God's loving kindness and faithfulness is another way to give thanks to the Lord. So to give thanks when you praise Him and you thank Him, but also to declare to others the loving kindness of the Lord and faithfulness of the Lord, that's another way to express your gratefulness to God, to God by speaking about it and declaring it to others. And this declaration is not only to be made on a good day when you feel good or a good night, but every night and every morning. St. Augustine observed on this passage and said, the father loves his children no less when he threatens than when he cares for them. Nor should be less grateful to God when he chastises us in the time of trouble than when he heaps favor on us in our prosperity. So if God is chastising us, it's for our benefit. That's why we will declare his loving kindness and his faithfulness. If he actually shower us with his favor, again, we will declare his loving kindness and his faithfulness. Music is a symbol of joy. That's why he said, praise God on an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp with harmonious sounds, harmonious sounds. Deacon should sing in a harmonious sound room. <laughs> so, worship and honor to God may be expressed on an instrument of ten strings on the lute, but it is to be sang with harmonious sound. The first three verses of this psalm show that worshiping and honoring God have many different aspects and expressions by our words, by declaring to others his loving kindness and his faithfulness, and also on music. We should worship God in an honoring way, to honor him. And the church father focused more on the spiritual meaning of this verse. For example, St. Clement of Alexandria tells us that an instrument of ten strings means the Lord Jesus himself. So this instrument is Jesus Christ, seemingly because 
the initial letter of his holy name, the Yota. The Yota is not a term uh, in, in, uh, in Greek. So the initial letter, Isos, is the first letter is Yota. And Yota is number 10. So the initial letter of his holy name stands for number 10, both in Hebrew and Greek, in Hebrew language and in Greek language. That's why he said the 10 strings refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. So if the hand an instrument of 10 strings and the tongue the heart, so he said the hand like the 10 strings, those who have 10 fingers, and the heart is the tongue. Work together in the delightful work of praise. Because with our hands, we can play music, and with our tongue, we praise God. Saint Jerome has another interpretation of the ten strings. He said, We pray to the Lord on an instrument of ten strings. The ten strings are our body, soul, and spirit. We'll all play together in harmony to produce a nice tune. Because number three is a number, perfect number, and number ten is a perfect number. So body, soul, and spirit is a perfect number three. So all, I'm not praying, praising God with my tongue, but with my spirit, with my soul, with my mind, with my wholeness. That's the ten string. St. Augustine says, you have not heard of the psaltery of ten strings for the first time. It signifies the Ten Commandments of the Lord. So he said the Ten Strings is the Ten Commandments. But we must think upon that psaltery and not carry it only. For example, don't memorize them and we don't apply them. So not carry, all, carry them only, but apply them. For even the Jews have the law, but they carry it. They, they knew it, but they did not apply it. They sing not, they do not sing it. And upon the heart, so the ten strings mean the ten commandments. The heart, according to St. Augustine, this means in word and deed, not only by word, but our actions, with a song in a word upon heart and work. So song is the word, heart is the deed. So all these instruments of music were typical of the spiritual joy. As I told you, when we come to praises like yeah, we are joyful, we are delightful. So these are symbols of spiritual joy that believers have in their heart when they praise the Lord. Verse 4. Now he's saying, why it is good to praise the Lord? For you, Lord, have made me glad through your word. I will triumph in the words of your hands. Contemplation of the divine work of God caused the psalmist to be glad. It was natural for him to sing because when he, he was glad, when you are glad, he sings. Those who have themselves experienced the blessedness, the pleasantness of the duty of praising God can best recommend it to others. When you experience the delight and the joy of praising the Lord, you will encourage others to come and praise the Lord with you. He said, you made me glad because of your word. You made me glad through your word. It may be the work of creation when we reflect on the creation. The finishing of the creation was on the Sabbath. That's why every Sabbath he remembered the creation that was fulfilled on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is the day in which the Lord rested. It's a day designed particularly to commemorate the creation. And here the focus is entirely on God, not on the self, your work, O oh God. And he thought also, triumph. I will triumph in the words of your hand. So the triumph is found not on what we do for God. No. But on what God has done with his own hands for us. Again, 
the triumph is not in what we do for God, but in what God has done with his hand for us. The psalmist had been studying the beauty of God's work of the heavens, the earth, and all creation, and he had been delighted with the work of God. But it was not God's work that delighted him only, but it was in God himself he delighted. Not only in his work, but in God himself. Because the words of God led the psalmist to reflect on God's own infinite beauty. That's why in verse 5 he said, O Lord, how great are your words. Your thoughts are very deep. Now he's reflecting on God himself. Your thoughts, not your words only, but your thoughts are very deep. So the psalmist was pleased, overjoyed, and will therefore daily exalt and praise God in the words of his hand. And he thought, your thoughts are very deep. The thoughts behind this creation, behind the economy of salvation, behind every word are very deep. Your plan, your purpose, O oh God, as it is clear in your words of creation and providence, are too profound for man to understand them. It is beyond our comprehension. Who can comprehend all this work or the thoughts except God himself? So having said that he was delighted so much with the words of God, for fear he should be supposed to have comprehended them thoroughly or had to have a knowledge of the excellence of all God's work, now he is adding that the work of God are too great, and the wisdom of God is in producing them too profound for any person in this life to comprehend. That's why he said, your thoughts are too deep. Your thoughts are very deep. He cannot comprehend the magnitude of them as Sirach said, who has numbered the sand of the sea and the drops of the rain and the days of the world? Who has measured the height of heaven and the breadth of the earth and the depth of the earth? No one. Yet however great they may be, greater beyond comparison is the wisdom that created them. That's why people who are atheists or denying the existence of God, if they reflected on the creation, on the world, on the cosmos, they will come to a conclusion there is a great mind, there is greater beyond comparison is the wisdom that created the whole world. There is no comparison. Your thoughts are very deep. Uh, that's why in Sirach, after Sirach reflected on the numbers of the sand, number of the raindrop, he said, Who has examined the wisdom of God which precedes all things? No one, no one can understand or comprehend the wisdom of God. So, Sirach, uh, sorry, the psalmist, verse 6, he concludes this passage, this part, these three verses, by saying, a sinless man, senseless man, a senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand. So those who are denying the existence of God, they are senseless and fools. A senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand them. So he concludes this part of the psalm that delights on creation by asserting that it is only the wise and not the senseless or the fool. Only the wise who can know how great and mysterious are the works of the Lord. Fools never look for anything in the creation, but the pleasure and the advantage they drive from. It. So they enjoy that pleasure of the creation but they did not look beyond the creation 
Казав, що ні, то він це. Бавдавай. Though they don't comprehend the greatness of the works of God, still they seem they are un- unable to comprehend all the works of God, and they are sensible for their ignorance therein. And the more they are sensible of it, the more they admire God's work and come to the ne- near to the true wisdom, and the more they will praise God and they will be delightful in praising God. Commentators give several explanations for the distinction between the two classes of persons named here, the senseless and the fool. Some say the first, the senseless, belong to unbelievers who know nothing of the wisdom of God. And the second, the fool, are the evil Christians. So the first, non-believers, but the second are the Christians but who are living a wicked life. So they know the external facts, the evil Christian, know the external facts of the truth about God, but are unable to comprehend them because of their unwillingness, because they are living uh, an ungodly life. Other commentators say, the man who is unconcerned of the heavenly things is the senseless, and him who is eager about earthly matters. We as Christians, as St. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, set your mind on things above, not on things below. Uh, so the senseless, those who are not concerned uh, about heavenly things, and the poor, those who focus only on earthly matters. Senseless can be the Jews who rejected God, and the poor are the Gentiles who never learned the God. So it is explained to denote the man gifted with worldly wisdom, but who is poor of spiritual knowledge. So the senseless, an intelligent person, but he is lacking the spiritual knowledge. And the fool is the man who has neither the wisdom of this world nor the heavenly wisdom. So if our joy is in the things of this world, and we do not find our joy in God, then we are senseless enemies of God, or we don't understand. Verse 7, now from verse 7 we will speak about the destruction of the wicked. Since he mentioned the senselessness and the, the fool, so he will speak about the destruction of the wicked. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. So verse 7 introduces the statement of the truth, the senseless man does not understand which is prosperity of the wicked. But the prosperity of the wicked is momentary, and they will be destroyed forever. To the fool and the senseless, they will not understand that the prosperity of the wicked are just for a moment. Very temporary, very transient. So the time is so many times when the wicked seem to prosper and flourish. They grow quickly like grass and seem to flourish. Yet he also know that their prosperity was only to lead up to their destruction. It is that they may be destroyed forever. So the meaning here is not that the purpose of their being thus made to flourish is that they should be destroyed, but this will be the result. There is a difference between the purpose of flourishing, like you bring uh, cacao and, and feed the cow in order to flatter it. No. The meaning of this verse, no. God is not making them flourish in order to destroy them. No. But he is saying, their flourish, when they flourish or they are prosperous, it's just temporary. The end result of it they will be destroyed because they are not righteous. They will not be 
had in another world, even if like the rich man and Lazarus, he was prosperous all his earthly life, but not in the eternal life. So they will not be happy in another world by their prosperous and prospered wickedness. There is no Sabbath rest of mine or of future happiness awaiting the wicked. We here on earth, we wait for our rest. Here in the world of trouble, world of labor. But the paradise is the place of rest. When we say repose their soul, means give them rest. Water of rest. So, for the wicked, there is no rest of mind or future happiness awaiting in him. Uh, verse 8, after he said, they may be destroyed forever, now he's comparing them with God. But you, Lord, are on high forevermore. So in contrast to the wicked, who have only temporary prosperity, God is set on high forevermore. So God's position is quite different from that of the wicked. The wicked, their elevation is temporary, but God, he is the most high forever. Most high forever means he is untouched by any change. Not like the grass of the field, but he is the most high. He is not one that he can perish because he is forever him. Verse 9. For behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. So, God's enemies counted God as a mere man. And they think they can stain God. And his memory can be blotted out. But, like they thought after he crucified, he crucified him and put him in the tomb, it's the end. But his very death itself was the overthrow of his spiritual and human enemies. He bound Satan, and, you know, this was the destruction of the Romans and the Jews. So, he said the word, behold, here, uh, twice. Uh, behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies shall perish. The word behold implies the suddenness of the change, as if he said that they so strive and flourished, will perish all at once. How fearful is it to become an enemy to God and a friend to the world because friendship of the world, as St. James said, is enmity to God. Do you not know that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world, make himself an enemy of God. James 4.4 4. Then, if we know that the enemies of God will perish, who wants to befriend the world? Who winds in his mind and decides to befriend the world and make himself an enemy to God? For behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies. The repetition here for the emphasis. It also adds the greatest force to the passage and bring the reader attention and make them observe the result of being an enemy of God. They shall perish. All the worker of iniquity shall be scattered. This is but a repetition and explanation of the first part of the verse. When he said they will perish, all the worker of iniquity shall be scattered. So, those, the enemies of God, are the workers of iniquity, and they will perish and they will be scattered. Verse 10. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. Now, 
the psalmist contrasts the faith of the just, the righteous, with that of the wicked. And so that they will one day be exalted by divine providence and justice. So the righteous will be exalted. Even if they are not exalted here on earth, like the Lazarus and the rich man. When both of them died, who was exalted? Lazarus, not the rich man. The horn is a symbol of strength and might. That's why he said, my horn, my power, my strength, you have exalted. It is you, not me, like a wild ox. So the wicked are destroyed, but the righteous have their strength exalted by God. Again, this can be applied to Christ. The horn of salvation rests up in the house of David. So Jesus Christ on the day of the resurrection, he was exalted, but his enemies perished. Also, we refer to the exaltation as the right hand of God and the strength and the glory of the kingdom of God. I have been anointed with fresh oil. Oil usually symbolizes what the Holy Spirit. So, oil signifies the Spirit of God, the gifts and the grace and the fruit of the Spirit. Fresh oil means new supply of His grace, which in Christ every day. His mercies are new upon us every day. That's fresh oil. So every day we receive new graces from the Holy Spirit. So it can refer to direct anointing of the Holy Spirit and the renewed joys and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the psalmist has additional blessings of seeing his triumph over his enemies. That's why he said in verse 11, my eye also has seen my desire on my enemies. Enemies here are the devil and the demons. My ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. So another reason that he saw the triumph over his enemies. Victory is assured for the people of God. But sometimes it's only understood by faith, but not seen with natural eye. As St. Paul said, everything work out for good to those who love God. My desire, my desire against the enemies did not arise from a revengeful spirit, but from a regard to the glory of God. I want God to be glorified and honored in defeating his enemies, God's enemies. So he would see that which would be for God's glory and that which would be absolutely right and just. So when, what's his desire when he said, my desire for my enemies? The triumph over the enemies will bring glory to God, honor to God. That's his desire, not revengeful spirit. Also, this verse can have reference to Christ and his victory over Satan on the cross. So those that rise up against Christ and said, crucify him, crucify him, will fall before him and be made his footstool. Some fathers say that it may point to the victory of the church at the end of the time. By no physical act on her own, victory not through war and battle, over the Jews and pagans who oppressed her in the early days of Christianity. So in the beginning of Christianity, the Jews and Gentiles oppressed the church. Then by fourth century, Christianity became the official religion of the whole world without Christian using weapons for battle. So that is the victory that God granted through the church. Or the victory here to the inner eye of the soul, beholding the victory of faith over temptation. When I am tempted with lust or sin, but the soul through the grace of God will defeat the temptation of the body. 
or this victory may point to the final overthrow of the sinner in the judgment in the next. Verse 12. These are beautiful verses, actually. Especially if parents thought about these verses and applied them to their children, like those who are planted in the house of the Lord. Do we plant our children in the house of God or not? Verse 13. But let's start from verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. The wicked flourish like what? Like grass. The grass appeals today and dies tomorrow. But the righteous, not like grass, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. The cedar, Shakr al one of the most beautiful trees. So, the wicked have their season of flourishing like grass, but the righteous shall flourish like the evergreen palm tree. So the psalmist now is comparing the righteous to the palm and cedar trees, in contrast to the wicked who had compared to grass. This image and comparison of a righteous man to a flourishing, majestic, green, and beautiful tree is very common in the scripture, like in Psalm, chapter, uh, Psalm 1, verse 3, Jeremiah 17, 8. Grass spring up in the morning, whether during the day or is cut down. It's a temporary thing of no longevity. Whereas the palm tree lives a long time and gives forth its fruit and its leaves for a very long time. The palm also grows to a great height and perfectly straight, symbolizing, symbolizing desire to heavenly things and uprightness uh, of life. It grows as long as it lives, is an evergreen, always fruitful, symbolizing a spiritual improvement and continuous life of forever. Its leaves, the leaves of the palm, spread out about as high as possible from the ground. And its fruit is among the leaves, symbolizing the greatness of the intention and action, both together. The intention and action. The, the intention is the leaves, the action is the fruit. And every part of it is good for some purpose. Every part of the palm is good. Showing that in a holy life, every ability, every talent, every uh, opportunity will not go to waste. Everything is beneficial. The palm tree never bends before the storm. When there's a storm, you will never see a palm tree bend. It's a symbol of victory. The children of God, when there is storm or hardship or affliction, they are like palm tree, strong. So the wicked strive and prosper for a while, and then they will be thrown into fire like the grass. But the righteous, like the palm tree, shall flourish and hold leafy green and bear the sweetest fruit forever. The cedar, on the other hand, in its vast spreading amnesty and majesty, in its deep root, sweet aroma, incorruptible wood, uh, and its great longevity serves as a type of other attributes of the righteous. The righteous shall grow to an enormous height like the palm tree, sending out its branches of good work and roots of perseverance, which will enable the righteous to resist in a storm, however great of temptation. Now in verse 12 and 13, explaining why the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree, why he shall glow like a cedar in Lebanon. Because those who are planted, they are planted in the house of the Lord, shall flourish in the court of our God, inside the church, in the court, inside the church, not outside the church. So now he gives a reason for having compared the righteous to palm and cedar. Because they will not be planted 
in the woods or wild mountains, but they are planted in God's own house, inside the church. God's house, the place of his presence, is the place where the believers are both planted and where they continually live and thrive. That's why parents bring their children and plant them. And the word they plant them, many parents they bring their children and children run all the time and they are not focusing. They are not planting them. But planting deeply rooted in the church, these people actually they will never drift away. So the righteous, likened to these three, can flourish only when planted within his church, not merely inside its visible limits, as I said about children who run everywhere, but not merely inside the church, but rooted in the church, in the doctrine of the church, in the virtues of the church, in the Holy Spirit, in the sacraments, in the worship. They will be planted in God's church by true faith, watered by the sacraments and by his word, rooted in charitable deeds. They will not fail to give out in abundance the flowers of virtue and the fruit of good works. When they are planted, then we will see the fruit of the Holy Spirit in them. Outside the church and without the foundation of faith, every plantation will be rooted up. As the Lord said, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted, will be a root. Matthew 15, 13. Verse uh, 13. They shall still bear fruit in all the age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. So even if they are aging, but they shall be fresh and flourishing. Uh, as St. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, from outside, the outward man is dying, is perishing, but the inner man is renewed every day. So, it's possible to be outwardly wasting away, yet inwardly renewed day by day. We saw, a few days ago, we celebrated the 11th memorial of our beloved father, Antonius Fortunio. And we saw that outwardly the, the, the body was dying, but inwardly it was fresh, green, renewed, pure. So even if the outward man is wasting away, but the inwardly man renewed day by day. The body will get weaker as the person gets older, but the soul is renewed. As we read in Psalm 103, verse 5, Who satisfies your mouth with good things, that your youth is renewed like the eagle. So here reference is made to that distinguishing attribute of the palm tree. What is the distinguishing attribute of the palm tree? It never ceases to bear fruit. So even in old age, the righteous continue to bear fruit like the palm tree however old it may be. Its produce is more abundant in its latter years. So the palm tree, the older it gets, the more fruit it will have. While the cedar, though not a fruit-bearing tree, continues to spread in size and greenery to an old age. So signify, signifying the constant vitality and fruitfulness of the church and of the holy soul to the end of their earthly time, to the last breath. Again, we saw Dr. Shenouda until a few days before his departure, giving sermon and preaching. So, to the last breath, they are vital, fruitful, and they bear fruit of the Spirit in their life. To declare that the Lord is upright. So when we see how the righteous are like palm tree and cedar, 
and they are bear fruit in old age, they are fresh and flourishing even in old age, then this in itself will declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighte unrighteousness in him. So the psalmist used a lot of imagery to convey the point that God will give strength, stability, longevity to the righteous, to those who are his. That's why the psalm ends just as it began, with praise God. The Lord is my rock. There is no unrighteousness in him. Again, praising the Lord. This is why the people of God live in a blessed way that gives honor and attention to God and bear fruit. So, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So when we let God the light and we bear fruit, this will bring glory to God, to declare the Lord is upright. So, it isn't to draw attention to ourselves as wonderful people, but to make known and declare that the Lord is upright, that they may glorify your Father who is in heaven. This mercy to the aged righteous proves the faithfulness of their God and leads them to show that the Lord is upright by their testimony to his continuous goodness to them even to the old age. The happy and flourishing old age of the righteous is a strong indication of God's faithfulness and truth, showing that he keeps his promises never forsake those that put their trust in him. Uh, it's written about Moses uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, he became 120, but his vitality never disappeared from him. The Lord is upright. Well, how does the fruit bearing of an aged Christian show that? Or why it shows that God has kept his promise? Why the, the fruitfulness of each per, person proves that the Lord is upright? I tell you why. Because God has promised that he will never leave them nor forsake them, even in the old age. God has promised when they are weak in their old age, then they shall be strong through the grace of God. Has promised that if they seek him, if they seek God, they shall not lack any good thing. For though he allows the wicked to prosper for a while, he will in his own time exercise the justness of his justice by rewarding the good and punishing the wicked. The Lord is my rock. So the psalmist has found God a rock, strong, steadfast. His word as firm as a rock, his promises as firm as a rock. He is right and good and strong. There is no unrighteousness in him. So this is said in the most absolute form, implying the most entire confidence in God. God is altogether to be trusted. He is the rock who keeps us and loves us throughout all of the life of Jesus. This concludes Psalm 19. Glory be to God.